بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين جزاك الله خيرا دكتور مارجي for uh, for the refreshing uh, perspectives and uh, and the reset reset on the world view is very important because these world views we keep speaking about these paradigms these uh, lenses through which we see the world you don't intentionally adopt them you just inhale them they're literally in the ether and so we have to be completely certain absolutely certain that without the quranic world view you're in the dark you're in the dark uh, intentionally or unintentionally consciously or unconsciously and so subhanallah uh, there are people who the natural inborn desire of wealth has compromised their integrity uh, to a point of no return, may Allah forbid. And there are other people who even with good intentions reacted to the dominant worldview and even became alienated from ethical investment, which our deen also called us to, because they just sort of overreacted, overcompensated to the other side. You know, when I think of uh, Muhammad ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, and how he was able to uh, reconcile between being an investor uh, and being a person of integrity, the two eyes, I guess. Uh, you know, let me just finish for you his story. <laughs> Muhammad ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, after he dumped out uh, those barrels of, of oil or, uh, or whatnot that he found the dead rats in, he went, they say, you know, into extremely bad debt for a while to the point that he went into prison. He was imprisoned for it. Because you know, his uh, creditor comes after him and he doesn't have the money and these are rights. Not saying he was sinful, but he sort of was liable. And so he was imprisoned at the request of his creditor. And while he was in prison, <laughs> the, the guards at the door of the prison would tell him, listen, I know how much like Fajr Salah is important to you religious people. And so if you want to go out for Salat al-Fajr, just come back quick and I'm going to let you out and I'll let you back in and nobody has to know. And so Muhammad ibn Sirin, rahimahullah's integrity once again shined. And he said to him, listen, I will not assist you in betraying your boss, right? Because that would be a betrayal of your, uh, your duty to Allah Azza wa Jal in consequence. And then Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu an, the great Sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the mentor of Muhammad ibn Sirin. Muhammad ibn Sirin was very close to Anas ibn Malik. Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu an, dies while he's in prison. And ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, was the person found in Anas's will that the person to wash my body before burial would be Muhammad ibn Sirin. That was the piety that they expected anew of this man. And so they came to him and said, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, the great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has passed away. Uh, and he has left in his will and testament that you wash his body, nobody else. And so he said, I cannot do that and I refuse to do that unless you get me permission from the creditor not the emir. It's his right, not the emir's right. The emir is just the executive arm of the government carrying out the rules of Allah Azza wa Jal and the rights he gave to his creation. Go get permission from him and it was granted permission for him. He was just beautiful souls, right? You know, it reminds me also of, uh, of Abdullah al-Mubarak, rahimahullah, who was a great early Hanafi scholar, rahimahullah, uh, in those very early years of the madhahib, he would be argued to be a great Hanafi scholar for sure. He was a great scholar regardless of how you categorize him, legalistically speaking. This man, his assets, they would estimate they're at about 400,000 dirham. They say he would profit about 50,000 a year and he never paid zakah in his life. You say, astaghfirullah. No, no, not astaghfirullah. I'm not citing him for an astaghfirullah moment. It is because he never held on to the money and never got broke from spending the money in the way of Allah Azza wa Jal. He felt such a sense of trust of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and a sense of responsibility for the ummah, 
that he used to say, were it not for six people, I would never do business. He was a businessman. They were the two Hamads and the two uh, Sufyans. And uh, so Hamad ibn Salama, Hamad ibn Zayd, Sufyan al Thawri, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Al Fudayl ibn uh, Iyad, and there's a sixth one. Uh, Were it not for these six people, I would never do any business. In other words, you guys go serve the ummah. I'm going to put in the work, and I'm going to fund you guys, your stipend. And, and so he would constantly spend on them, year in and year out, in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal, and he never went broke, ever. And he would spend on himself as well. He would go out for jihad in the path of Allah one year, and go hajj the other year, and rotate in that way. There's actually a beautiful incident that comes to mind, that Qurtubi rahimahullah mentions it, in his explanation to Sahih Muslim. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in this hadith in Sahih Muslim, whomever sponsors one horse to fight in the path of Allah, and meaning the, the horse and all of its uh, attachments, like the, the gear on the horse, on the war horse, Allah will transform that for them into 700 of them on the day of judgment. So during one of the battles, Abdullah al-Mubarak rahimahullah, he noticed one of the men very down, perhaps he was even crying, and he told him, what's going on? He said to him, my horse is dead, or he may have said dying. And he said to him, all right, sell it to me. Sell me your dying horse. And he said to him, are you serious? He said, yes, how much is it worth when it was alive? He said, it's worth like 4,000 dirham. Dirham is like a silver coin, basically. He said to him, okay, I'll give you its full price. I'm not going to sort of haggle with you. I'll give you, as if it were a healthy horse, the 4,000. So he buys the 4,000. The next morning at Fajr, this man comes back to him and says, hey, you, sell me my horse back. He said, what are you talking about? It's dead. <laughs> we already went over this. He said to him, I'll give you the 4,000 back. Just give it back to me. He said to him, why? It's like something's missing here. Why? He said to him, I just saw last night in my dream that I was in Jannah. I was in paradise. And then out of nowhere, I see my horse, this horse. And behind it are 700 horses, all armored up, but in gold and silver and rubies and emeralds. So I said, oh man, this is my horse. So I went to grab the whole a herd of horses behind him as well. And the angels pushed me away and said, that's not your horse anymore. That's the horse of Abdullah al-Mubarak. And so he went back to Abdullah al-Mubarak, realized so much khayr will come out of sort of, you know, uh, what is the word? Sustaining this loss, this financial loss, which is, was actually an investment from the angle of Ibn al-Mubarak, rahimahullah. And so he said, I want my horse back. I'll accept the loss. But Ibn al-Mubarak had already paid it out. He accepted the loss from a financial materialistic perspective. So he wouldn't sell it back to him and he said to him essentially, ma ra'aytahu fil manami, ra'aytuhu fil yaqadha. What you saw while you were asleep, I saw while I was awake. The vision Dr. Umarji was speaking about. What will become of things as Allah and his messenger promised, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I see it. Not with my eyes, but with my insight, through the words of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so, you know, maybe one reminder in after speaking about integrity and the barakah found in integrity and investing in the right ways and not precluding the akhirah investments from it, uh, is that your ability to do that, to trust Allah with your sadaqat in general, with your. Uh, devotional investments, with your akhirah investments, this is actually to be grown. Because it, it, it's not the same. The capacity to trust God with your sadaqah, it doesn't just come automatically. It doesn't even just come from lectures. It may not just come immediately the moment you read that ayah or the hadith. It's by acting on it over and over again, Allah Azza wa strengthens your capacity to give up the inborn desire that we all have for wealth. 
You know, Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, and I only have four minutes left, he mentioned something very interesting. When, you know, Ka'b ibn Malik, the man who stayed behind at Tabuk, and he was so sincere in his repentance that Allah sent down his being absolved in Surah Tawbah, he was so happy that Allah forgave him for that blunder that he gave all his money for the sake of Allah, and the Prophet ﷺ refused to accept it. He said, no, take it back. Not all of it. What does that remind you of? Who else did that? Abu Bakr radiallahu an. And the Prophet sallallahu accepted it from Abu Bakr radiallahu an. Right? So Ibn Hajar rahimahullah says, this reminds us of the fact that it's not for everyone to spend it all just like that. It's subjective. You don't play sort of games with your deen. <laughs> because what if you can't handle it yet? Pace yourself. When it comes to mandatory spending like zakah, there's no gradualism. You got to pay your zakah. That's someone else's money the day it's due that's currently in your pocket or your account. But the, the sky's the limit, but grow methodically. Grow slowly. Grow your trust. Grow Because part of it has to do with trust. The ability to live on less financial means for certain stretches, they would always get their money back, requires trusting Allah. Like as one of my mashayikh said, if Abu Bakr al-Siddiq had given all of his money, radiallahu an, and not gotten it back next week, he would not doubt his faith. Didn't the hadith say no wealth is decreased from charity, right? If Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he had so much yaqeen that if he would have died of starvation, he would not have lost his faith. But not everyone is Abu Bakr. And it could be reckless to do what he did when you're not at where he was at. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda. So it's subjective. It varies from person to person. It was part of the honesty of, of the Sahaba with Allah. Like Sa'd ibn Ubad radiallahu anhu, he used to actually say, Oh Allah, you know that a little bit of money is no good for me and I'm, not, I'm no good like that. I'm just going to need a little bit more right now. It's a process. It's a project. And I'll, I'll mention to you finally one more anecdote that comes to mind, which was Raja ibn Haywa. Raja ibn Haywa, uh, rahimahullah, was the advisor of Umar Abdul Aziz and a great early scholar, scribe of hadith. He used to take his salary and donate it in the way of Allah Azza wa on the way home. And it became a habit for him that by the time he got home, he would find the exact amount in his house. Perhaps Allah exposed him in a beautiful way to one of the wealthy people, so he would sort of like no, realize the habit. So eventually his salary would get replaced every single time. He'd spend it and still find it. So one of his, his cousin, I believe, discovered this. Oh, that's amazing. And so he went and he donated all his money. And then he went home, he picked up the pillow. <laughs> and there was nothing there. And so he came and complained to Raja, this great imam, and said to him, like, I did what you did, but I didn't get what you got. Like, what's up? And he said to him, لِأَنَّكَ تُجَرِّبْ You're trying God. I'm certain there will be compensation. So growing your certainty is a project you want to embark on. It's a beautiful project. Wallahi, personally, and I know so many things wrong with my relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal I'm trying to remedy. I've never seen an investment like donating. I've never seen it in my personal life. And if there was time, I would share with you a little bit of some of these micro stories. They're unbelievable. Dollar for dollar, you know, same day, five, ten times that I can think of. It's amazing. But it's like a virtuous cycle that you want to build. And so go ahead and invest and put your trust in Allah when you're investing in dunya and maximize your investments in the akhirah and diversify them. And may Allah Azza wa Jal grant us and you always proper reliance on Him and the best assumptions of Him. And may He be pleased with His uh, righteous servants in every time and place, those we still feed off of their inspirations even here and now, like the companions and the tabi'een, and reunite us with them in Jannah. Allahumma ameen. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakallahu khairan.